Go, go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual Agile Shift conference session. Before we begin, I want to inform you about a feature in the presentation that will make the session more interactive. Please make note of the question mark icon at the upper right of the presentation screen. Clicking that icon will open the question and answer feature, which allows you to send questions to our moderator that will be delivered to our presenter at the appropriate times. We are excited to pre present Matthew Joshua, Manager of Software Quality Engineering at Walters Kluwer, who will be sharing Teaching an Elephant to Dance. Take it away, Walter. I'm sorry, Matthew. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for dialing in this afternoon. I want to take a quick moment to thank um, Devlin and Max and Mike and the entire uh, team for their servant leadership and also uh, doing something virtually for the Houston community. And actually, now this is a global thing, so thank you all. Um, I'm actually glad to be um, here this afternoon. Um, I do not know anything much about elephants or dancing, but this is an analogy. Most of us are probably familiar with the book Teaching an Elephant to Dance. It's about managing something complex, managing something large, change management. And I'm specifically going to be talking today about managing or migration of a large data center to the cloud. It, it's probably not a surprise to any of you that most of our workloads are moving to the cloud. Um, cloud migrations can be very large and very complex. So this whole presentation is split into three parts, migrating your workload, optimizing your workload, and also transforming. We all have heard of digital transformation. We will decrypt it as much as possible in the limited time we have. Now, who is this guy? Who am I? Um, so my name is Matthew Joshua, and I have had the privilege to work with a fantastic team the past two years to migrate a large data center to the cloud. Um, my primary job was actually managing quality engineering, and I had a stellar team um, who actually was doing quality engineering, you know, testing. Uh, but I got this opportunity to get involved. Um, I was a member of Scrum teams. I'm not uh, from an IT department, so this whole presentation is not going to be from an IT vantage point. It's going to be from an agile practitioner's vantage point or a regular ordinary person in a Scrum team. How do they tackle transformation? How do they tackle roadmap disrupting changes? So I love cloud optimization. In the past two years, we've been working on optimization as well. I'm an agile practitioner. And on the weekends, I love volunteering in the local community. So before we dive in, I want to be very clear. You could Google search for five minutes and actually identify a whole bunch of things about cloud migration. There's IT departments talking about it. There's uh, cloud vendors talking about it. So some of the tips and tricks in this presentation you're going to see comes from a layman's point of view. What are some of the things you could do so that you avoid the pitfalls and the mistakes that I made or the mistakes that we made? And how did we manage to migrate a fairly large workload? Um, there's something for everybody in this. In the next few minutes, I'm going to walk you through how you could migrate your workload, or if you're already on the cloud, most probably several of your organizations are already on the cloud. I'm going to walk you through how you could potentially save tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in optimization. You don't have to pay what you do not use. How do you optimize your workload is essentially what we're going to go through. Um, I have the privilege of working for a fine um, corporation uh, based here in Houston. It's actually Baltus Clover is based in the Netherlands, but we have an office here in Houston. Um, we cater to 93% 93 of Fortune 500 companies, all the top 100 accounting firms and the uh, top 100 global law firms. What does this mean? This means that we have a lot of data centers and data centers are soon becoming a thing of the past. You walk into a software development organization now, you do not see a lot of those glass rooms with millions of blinking lights and hundreds of cables going from one server to the other. Now, under Walters Kluwer, I work for this uh, division called Walters Kluwer ELM Solutions. As you can see, we have 14 offices worldwide, and um, we actually spend a lot of time 
serving customers in an array of divisions, you know, different domains. It's not just one domain. We are kind of the sales force of uh, enterprise legal management. Uh, close to 130 plus of our clients are Fortune 500 companies. This also means that we had a fairly large data center. Now, how big was the elephant? Let's deep dive and look at what kind of challenge or what scale we are looking at. So like I mentioned, this was the largest single location data center in the Walters Kluwer global footprint. We had close to 1500 virtual machines and keep in mind that we did not have a dedicated DevOps group at that time. Engineering group had a ton of servers. We had nightly tests running. We had our CIs running and we also had a roadmap laid out ahead of us in 2018. So this meant this meant potential roadmap disruption changes in release dates, what's going to happen to the nightly tests that are running, are bugs going to fall through the cracks. The technical support group, which actually had won a couple of awards recently for being one of the best legal service technical um, services organization, they had concerns, 24 bar 7 support, interruptions. So if you just look at this slide, it's pretty obvious that this was quite a large elephant and making it dance, making it move to the cloud and making it the way, you know, operating the way you really wanted to was quite a challenge. I'm going to break one of the present basic presentation rules here this afternoon. Do not start a presentation with bad news. But this has, what you're seeing in front of you is actually some real facts. 96% of the polled companies in two of the surveys that I've combined here together are in the process of moving to the cloud. Cloud migrations in several of these leaders who were polled, the IT leader said, it's going to take more than one year to complete. Just think of your roadmap and what's going to actually happen. Um, So just think of um, the impact that it could have if migration actually lasts more than um, two years. Um, several of the cloud migration projects uh, went over budget. And several of those companies had to rewrite their apps in the cloud. So as you can see, it is quite a complex project to migrate your workloads to the cloud. So I quickly want to pause here and ask the question, if it is so complex, why would you really want to move to the cloud? What are some of the reasons? Is it because some leader in your company, probably for the right reasons, wanted to move to the cloud? Could it be because um, your corporate IT decided to consolidate data centers and they decided to move to the cloud? Could it be that um, you want to get on a digital transformation journey and wanted to look and sound cool? You wanted to say, hey, we are on the cloud. Everybody is on the cloud. Is that why you want to move to the cloud? I would not know what's the primary driver. Your organization is the only one who would know what's the primary driver. You like it or not, this may come as no surprise to you. 48% of the workloads are going to be in the public cloud by end of 2020. And the interesting part is nearly half of the data is also in the public cloud. So the floodgates have opened more and more corporations, more organizations are moving to the public cloud. What you're looking at on my slide is a state of the cloud report. Consider the gold standard in cloud computing information, in cloud computing reports. And this just came out close to a month ago. And as most of us can appreciate, we are in a very unique um, circumstance and the pandemic that has forced most of us to work remotely has significantly contributed to the cloud adoption and the cloud acceleration. So in several of the IT leaders polled here, as you can see, more than 37 percentage have clearly stated and if you are a small and medium business and enterprises, 29 percentage have clearly articulated that their cloud capacity or their cloud usage is going to be significantly higher than planned. 
why move to the cloud? None of this is probably new to any of you. It is an integral part of your digital transformation journey from a monolithic centralized aging on prem environment which needs heating and cooling and dependent on IT even to increase your hard disk space or increase your memory. You are moving to a modern cloud where it is elastic. You have multiple storage technologies. You have DR and backups automatically taken care. Your compliance and security is taken care by your vendor. So there's just so many advantages. But you have to be clear on what's the value that your organization derives by moving to the cloud. As I mentioned, you can definitely be more flexible. You do save time because you are focusing on what you are actually good at, which is developing software or drilling for oil or whatever that may be. And your collaborations get better. Your backup is a lot more safer. So it's a no brainer in a sense. Moving to the cloud can definitely be of tremendous advantage, give you an edge in the competition in the marketplace. But just let's look at how to migrate to the cloud. So this was basically our journey the uh, past year. I'm going to quickly walk you through some tools we used. You could actually, like I mentioned earlier, go to Google and learn about how an expert can actually help you migrate to the cloud. But we had very, very few expert in house, so we all pulled together, formed a team and worked with internal IT for the migration. So at a high level, the program that we went under was called Data Center Consolidation or DCC. A J2C is nothing but a journey to the cloud. There are two options that we considered. One is a heavily transformative. There's a lot more transformation that was needed. That is called a cloud first approach. But we chose a lift and shift approach or a data center consolidation where the goal was a lightweight transformation and moving all of our entire workload that's close to 1400 VMs, lift and shift move an IaaS model to the cloud. Diving a little deeper, a lift and shift is maximum of 10 to 15 percent transformation. It is lowest cost and risk, but for a, an organization with two dozen scrum teams and support organization and a solid roadmap for the year, we would not have been able to move to the cloud and transform if we decided to slowly journey to the cloud. If you choose to transform, that might be a good viable alternative for your organization if it's agile and nimble. You may want to spend a lot more time in refactoring before you actually move. As you move, you are refactoring. So what we actually chose here is the blue line. If you could trace that, you are moving your entire workload to the cloud with minimal transformation, stay optimized, and then continue to work on transformation in an agile fashion. Let me just pause here and give you a heads up that we will have time for questions throughout this. So if any questions come to mind, please use the Q&A chat and uh, Michael, our producer, will be reading them out to me as we end this part. Now I'm going to walk you through some of the tools that we used, you know, getting into a little bit more detail. We decided to take a bunch of our servers and organize them into 200 to 400 servers, you know, migrated over, let's say two to four months. It could be done in three months. It could be done in, you know, four months. We decided to organize it by application product or service and also the organization is professional services wanting to go first or is engineering wanting to go first or is it tech services? Keep in mind one thing here, wave creation is not controlled by your IT department or by the expert vendor who came in. It's very important to keep your scrum teams, your support organization, your implementation organization in the loop and it's a collaborative effort between the migration team and the application teams. You want this out early so you clearly know if there's any disruption to your roadmap. Let's dive a little bit more deeper here. We had move groups. A move group is a single manageable group, 20 to 40 affiliated or map servers. The logic and rational behind this was simple. If I lift and shift an ecosystem, if I lift and shift one team or one product lines, QA environment. I want the whole thing to work as one ecosystem once it's moved over. 
executive communication, another key tool. Most of our executives were not interested, and in most organizations, executives are not going to be interested in your VM names and when it's getting cut over, but they are definitely interested in who is owning which piece. So this was a 30, 60, 90 day plan we published on a regular basis, showing the risks and showing who owned it. Is it a central IT owning it? Is it ELM? That is my business unit owning it. Are there going to be workshops, you know, on site trips? Are there going to be things like that? All published early. This is one of my favorite slides or my favorite tools. Each Scrum team was actually informed on when their VMs would be moving, when it will be cutting over, and when they need to have test engineers ready to be testing it. Hypercare or a war room is something that we developed a simple system where we would be the IT internal IT and other app team leads would be on standby to troubleshoot issues. I'd highly recommend publishing something like this if you ever um, go on a migration journey. Going back to executive communication, instead of sending a long email or setting up a one hour meeting, we just had a weekly steer co or steering committee where we clearly articulated what were some of the um, risks in the project. If there was anyone who was not responding, some of the names that you see here are the names of my good friends who actually helped with this migration. Um, have they signed off on the list that I showed you earlier? Is there is there build and replicate that is pending? Um, did everyone si sign off on the run books? You know, things like that. Um, one look at this and the senior executives knew that we are on the right track. Now, why is this important? This is important because migrations unfortunately run out of funding. Um, there's, a, there's funding from the vendors that come in. There's funding from internal IT that comes in, but you don't want to run out of funding. If you run out of funding, cloud migration projects are typically scrapped and you do not want to be in that place where half your data, half your VMs are on the cloud and the other half is in your data center. It's going to be expensive to get everything back. So it's very important and crucial especially while in this situation, in this year where IT budgets are being slashed, you want to make sure that you have executive buy-in. And these are some of the tools that I would recommend. Moving on fast, migration workshops, um, which was one of the most effective tools in our arsenal. We would actually do multi-site workshops. We would get together with internal IT as well as the app team leads and clearly lock in server baseline. I cannot recommend this high enough. You do not want to make changes to your source in the data center once you lock this in because your cutover is going to start. Your migrations are actually going to start. Identify any transformation that is needed. Um, we did heavily use Jenkins, so once you move everything over, you want to make sure that all the other pieces that are required for your CI CD is also moved so that the whole thing works as a contiguous group. Uh, and we decided to populate the um, move groups in the migration workshops. So moving on, here's another example of executive summary accomplishment and recommendations. This was always uh, published on a weekly, sometimes monthly um, phases. And none of this was problem free. What you're looking at is actually a real life key issues log that we published. We were very open and transparent mentioning to IT where we needed help and they were clearly transparent, clearly mentioning to us where the app team needed to step in. Please remember your IT department has goals to move the data centers. They would move the data centers and they would move to the next location. It's up to the app teams most of the time to test your workloads and optimize it. Just let IT know if there are risks in the project. Here's another tool I'd highly recommend, roaming risks. Many of you are familiar with this. What were the issues that were resolved? Who owned some of these? You know, did you find a security flaw that somebody had to own? Was any of these risks accepted? Um, and how did you mitigate those risks? So this is something else that we heavily um, leaned on. Coming to a close of part one, here are some of the key takeaways. Um, like I mentioned, when I stepped back, and looked at how we migrated this workload. Three themes, you know, if you forgot everything I mentioned, if you could just take these three themes away, you could successfully pull off a migration. And the first was collaboration. This would not have been possible if only engineers were part of this. There were some scrum masters who played a very crucial role in this migration. You might be wondering what could a scrum master do? 
I, I I love Scrum Masters. They have their head on a swivel. They know they actually should be knowing all disruptions coming to an agile Scrum team. So we had Scrum Masters who kind of tackled all of this coming down the pike. We had some wonderful product owners who were willing to adjust dates, release dates, and also swap migration dates. We made sure that um, executives are collaborating with us and they are un very empathetic to any disruptions in the roadmap. Last week, I was reading an article why 40% of ID projects fail. It was a Harvard Business Review article. They said one of the key things you could start, something very simple is start with mini projects or rapid release initiatives. And here's something you could collaborate on. Can you just lift and shift 10 VMs? Build a small win, build some confidence on that small win. So number one, collaboration is key. Communicate, more communication, and better communication. I've never been in an organization where an employee or a coworker complained that there's too much information coming from to me from the management. What I almost hear is, almost always hear is, oh, I didn't know that my VMs are going to be moved. I didn't know they are shutting down the um, development environment this weekend. I did not know. I didn't know. So I wish I knew sooner is what you hear. So publish the project plans. Review your security um, holes if there are any. You are going to be wanting to very clearly look at data security. Are you storing, storing customer data on the cloud? What kind of encryption do you have? What about disaster recovery? What's your backup strategy? You know, things like that. Last but not the least, uh, I did not plan to come up with three C's. It just happened to be our story and our journey. Your community of practice is going to evolve. You may not have a lot of fans in the beginning, but if you are working in a place with a bunch of developers and QAs and nerds, they will naturally be interested in gaining cloud skills. What we have realized is now we have a cloud community of practice with more than a dozen individuals. Some of my development counterparts have started to write PowerShell scripts and we continue to bring in our cloud vendor on site and continue to invest in our community. Some of your, if you are with AWS or Azure, you may even get some credits to go crack their certifications and they may offer free training for you depending on the agreement that they have. So let's take a pause here before we jump into the optimization journey. Jumping from the fire, jumping from the frying pan to the fire is how we felt when we moved from migrating um, to fully on the cloud. But I'm going to pause here and go back to Mike. Mike, do we have any questions at this point on phase one? Uh, we certainly do. We have five of them, in fact. Nice. So the first question, was every team easy to work with? How did you handle any teams who did want to move or had release work that made it difficult for them to find time to work on the migration? Good. So I'm going to be very honest here. I know this is being recorded, but it's fine. We definitely did had some uh, difficult, not just teams, it is probably an individual who was difficult. So two things. One, there's a bottoms up approach and a top down approach for something as big as this, you want to go top down. You want your C-level executives at product management and technology, engineering and product management to be completely aligned. So we had one product owner who did not want to move because he had a release date. I had multiple conversations with his C-level and they decided to change one release date. Then there were multiple product owners. We had to get people on a call. So when you look at competing priorities, sometimes they were willing to swap. So this is where you have to play the role of a mediator. You'll have to bring people on the same into the same meeting and ask, hey, product owner A, are you OK with cutting over this weekend? Somebody else will take your place two weeks down the line. So you have to make it that orchestration work. And like I said, your executive buy in was very, very important and it really helped us here. Um, so once the boss says, hey, it's OK, let's move and then you can adjust. You know, it happened. It was a lot more easier. OK, next question. Uh, what did you do about dependent systems being in different locations? For example, A calls B where A is in the cloud, B is in the data center. Did that cause problems? What adjustments did you have to make? Good. I think somebody has read through my slides already. <laughs> it, it, it was a problem. 
and that was one of the mistakes that we made. So we had certain boxes we had left behind um, in data center and we also use racks. Um, so we had some boxes in racks. We had connectivity issues from what we moved to the cloud talking to racks. So we had to get IT on board, did a little firefighting, opened up some ports so that the cloud machines could actually talk to other hosted machines. So we definitely had to include IT. I wish we knew about it earlier and planned for that outage. Great question. Okay, next question is, did you have big shared databases and some clients move and some not move? What did you do there? Yeah, so some of our databases, I'm going to leave the customers unmentioned, but where TBs in size. Um, and and be, I'm, I'm going to just not talk from a client perspective, but I'm also going to talk from a function perspective here. We had performance lab machines, right? We run performance test every night. Some teams run performance test every sprint. And some of those machines, you know, replicated customer data, so it was huge. And we decided to move them, but we had to get security exceptions in some instances. And we also ensured that Azure encryption meets the encryption standards for protecting the masked customer data. So that is from a data privacy angle. From a performance angle, we had to go and stripe the disks and we had to get Microsoft engineers to work with us so that there was parity in looking at the performance baseline, you know? So we had definitely some issues there too. All right, uh, next question. Uh, did you have custom protocols or ports that were difficult to move to the cloud? For instance, RMI that needed many open ports or similar network or security issues as you lift and shifted? Um, we did, but it wasn't a lot because our network and internal IT team was involved. Um, one of the issues we had was actually pushing blue codes for um, connectivity, essentially, right? So we had uh, Akamai set up, we were using Akamai, and we had a couple of blue codes pushes that we did where specific ports had to be opened and closed. That's one example. The second example was I had external vendors accessing some of our machines to test. Now, most of these machines did not have ports opened up for internet connection, so I had to go back and put in multiple requests to open up these ports. And soon we will be getting into some of the details as to what's the prep work you can do. Making sure that your connectivity is all mapped out is a very important component in migration prep. We will touch on it. Great question. And okay. we will have 10 minutes at the end for questions as well. So note down your questions. I'm going to stop again in 10 minutes and then at the end we'll have a solid 10 minutes for questions. OK, so I'm going to have uh, three more in this section. They've really been coming in now. So uh, did you find any servers that could not be lifted and shifted without extensive work to recreate the Docker or VM that you were using? Well, most of OK, so how do I say this without disclosing too much information? <laughs> Some of our VMs were super old, so the automated ASR migrations did fail. It's not going to work, so we had to do manual image copy. So there were some special snowflake situations and that should be included or addressed as a risk pretty early on. Um, so it wasn't smooth, right? Um, most of our VMs, if you're migrating a 2016, 2012 servers, it's going to be smooth, but your migration automation tool will have limitations no matter which um, cloud provider you pick. So you want to identify those VMs early, yes. So Mike, can we handle the rest, the other two questions towards the end? Yes, we can. I definitely am curious, yeah. Okay. Okay, can you still see my screen? I can see your screen. Okay, excellent. Thank you all, you know, great questions. Um, and at the end, I'm gonna publish my contact information as well. So you can hit me up on LinkedIn and um, shoot your questions, keep them coming. So optimization. Um, I'm actually a little saddened to read uh, the Gartner research that came out a few days ago. In 2019, IT spending globally was supposed to go up five to eight percentage, but after COVID-19 and the dynamic situation we have been in, Gartner is predicting an 8% drop in IT expenditure. The only silver lining there is cloud expenditure 
or cloud adoption is not doesn't look like it is um, going down. It's only going to accelerate, but I think it's important for each and every employee to keep dollars in your pocket in your company's pocket instead of handing it over to your cloud provider. So I'm going to quickly walk you through some of the hacks and some of the methods we tried. So we opened our doors. You know, our large data center was on the cloud and we came back after the holidays and our leadership basically called me into a room and said, hey, listen, we have a burning platform issue. All of you are familiar with this term burning platform issue. What is a burning platform? This fiery term refers to the story of an oil rig worker living on the North Sea oil rig who woke up one morning to a loud explosion and an all consuming fire. The man woke up, ran out of his bed and walked, stumbled upon the platform's edge. He confronted a 30 meter drop, a 15 story drop. He just jumped into the freezing waters. It wasn't a good choice to face. So a burning platform issue, if your organization is using that term, indicates three things. It sense of urgency. You got to do it now. This is important. And you have to make the changes work, no matter how difficult or frightening this process is. And when this employee who actually survived in the freezing waters, when he was rescued 10 minutes later, he noted that a burning platform caused a radical change in his behavior. So it's interesting to note we were not alone. We were um, definitely out of control on cost. But what you're looking at is the state of the cloud report I touched on earlier. 35 percentage of users are mentioning that they have a serious problem in wasted cloud spend. Now remember, every dollar that you save is probably equal to five or ten dollars in sales. So this is something outstanding for four years in a row. If you read the Flexera state of the cloud report, the number one focus seems to be optimizing spend. Interestingly, the number two is migrate more workloads, but the number one is optimizing the use of the cloud or cost savings. So we took a phased approach. If you are migrating, I would highly recommend reducing your footprint before you migrate. Think of you moving from one home to another. You bought a new home. There's a whole bunch of things you want to get rid of, so reduce your VM footprint if you can. Just by having conversations, we were able to reduce more than 100 VMs of different sizes. Resizing. Um, once you move to the cloud, you have to ask the hard question. When you migrate, you would have picked a particular size. Can you downsize that VM? Do you really need this VM to be over provisioned? Third was regulation. Who can create VMs? Who can delete? Who can destroy VMs? And how many admins do you really need? Who is the owner of the subscription? You know, things like that. Last but not the least is reforming or changing how you do business. While all these phases were in progress, we had to continue to monitor. We came up with close to a dozen reports, letting all the team leads and stakeholders know how we are spending, and we continue to advise uh, the business unit. I'm going to give you a quick overview on our cost optimization blueprint. The further right you look on my screen, the efforts are going to be more transformative. But on the left is some low hanging fruit that you can act on today. So let's start with shutting down VMs after business hours. All of us drive to work, not right now, but you know when we were driving to work, you know that after eight hours you're going to get back in the same car and drive back to your home. But you don't leave the engine running, do you? You shut down the engine when you're in the office and you turn it back on when you have to drive. So that's utility computing. Can we shut down all the VMs on a weekend? Can we shut down the VMs in an automated fashion or manual fashion after business hours? The second one, take your most powerful VMs and ask the hard questions to the app teams. Can we downsize these VMs, guys? Do you really need so much of high powered VMs? Would you do an experiment with us? Backup, that was a big one for us. Do you really need to back up every VM when there's good DR mechanisms that your cloud provider is providing? Ask yourself that question. The next one actually saved us a lot of money purchasing reserved instances. Uh, I know for sure that AWS and Azure, two of the top two cloud providers, um, offer reserved instances. If you know a VM's capacity and its usage, if your usage is predictable, I would highly recommend purchasing reserved instances for three years. You could save up to 30% to 40% of the cost. Automated power up and power down on VMs, we touched on it. 
Recently, we found out that we had 120 VMs or more that was unused for four months. Just by sending out email communication, we had several of those VMs deleted. So keep in mind, no app team is going to come to you and say, hey, I'm OK deleting my VMs. You have to constantly watch and report and ask if they can um, delete VMs. Sharing VMs and stacking products. Now we are getting into more transformation. That's something that we want to consider. And containers, you know, there, there are several container fans. Uh, we are still dipping our toes in the containers water. This is something that we have to. Now, if you take this approach, I can guarantee you, you will end up with lower running costs. Some of the prerequisites. Please, please have a solid cloud governance policy. M monitoring using Azure Monitor or whatever monitoring tools. Tagging of elements. Without tagging of elements, you will not be able to predict who is using up all of this. Who can create, who can delete, who can resize VMs? Can anyone just create a VM? Does it go through an approval process? You know, this is basically governance. Here's one of my favorites, communicating actionable info, not just a lot of data, but some. what you're seeing on the screen is some of the things that we started reporting on. Top 50 expensive boxes. We just found out that for the past four months, three of our top consumers were from one particular team, and we found out those are performance boxes. Now we are looking at, um, we are basically looking at more bang for the buck instead of chasing the whole department or the whole BU, the business unit. We are going after the top 50 expensive boxes. Simply, simple, rational, more bang for your buck. We have weekly consumption reports going out, and we always look at Azure Advisor recommendation. And um, here's one of the things that I would like to recommend. What's the motivation for a development team to reduce their infrastructure cost? Talk to your leaders. If you're a leader, would you like to gamify it? Several organizations have gamified it, and they have found out that each team is willing to go the extra mile, reduce their infrastructure cost based on the budget you give for them. How about giving them an Amazon gift card or a reward, a cash reward, based on a percentage of the drop that they come up with. Some of the effective optimization levers that worked for us, I already mentioned, um, turning things off. A Friday mass shutdown is something that I'm going to walk you through in a second. Here's another culture change that you will have to drive in your organization. Most VMs are cattle. It is not pets, but you know we all know those developers and QAs who hold on to their VMs. What, why, what do I mean by pets versus cattle? You know, traditional approach to operations, assets in the data center is viewed as a pet. Each server is hand raised and considered to be an extended member of the family, lovingly cared for and nurtured. When your servers get sick, do you really nurse them back to health or do you get rid of them? That answer should tell you if it's a pet or a cattle. If a pet server comes ill, an administrator rushes to the aid of that server, you know, you fix it, you nurse it back to health. Family portraits of these pets are often found pinned to cube walls, usually in the form of Visio diagrams. So that's basically the difference between a pet. Sorry about that. Um, a pet and, a, and, and cattle. In the cloud, cattle translate to a stateless and transient infrastructure. The infrastructure is commodity that can easily be recreated through automation. So this is a, a paradigm shift. This is a culture change where teams will have to understand, hey, all of my VMs are not pets. I may have one or two pet VMs, but most of my VMs are cattle. Here's another big one we found, reviewing storage, deleting and recreating premium disks. Um, I actually was amused to know that some of our most expensive VMs were deallocated, were shut down. And I asked myself the question, how can a VM that is not running cost you money? Answer was storage. If your storage is expensive premium, think of downgrading it to standard SSD and also think of deleting them and then recreating them when you power your VMs back up. Transformative in nature, but definitely great bang for your buck. And also look at enabling backups carefully. We just shut down backups for a whole bunch of our VMs that were non-business critical, and that did save us a lot of money. Please monitor using whatever monitoring tool your cloud provider is providing. In our case, it was Azure Advisor and Azure Cost Management gives you a good idea about where your costs are trending, how things are going. I want you actually to um, show you a, a very simple um, graph that shows 
how well we did by taking one action. We decided to shut down VMs on a Friday after business hours, all of our VMs. Now, there were exceptions. There were build VMs. There were certain customer critical VMs. We did exclude them. The interesting part was on a Monday, everything wasn't coming back up. It was gradual. Some of these Mondays were, you know, company holidays. So we would see a gradual powering up based on the need. Just imagine the number of weekends where we did not do this. There were several weekends when you had thousands of me VMs, thousand plus VMs just running, but nobody was accessing them. So if your organization is OK with it, if your app teams are OK with it, try proposing a Friday shutdown. Now, all of this is good. How did the results look? Unfortunately, I cannot show you the numbers. Uh, that will put me under serious risk, but when we opened the doors, this is how we looked the first bar. In two months, we were able to uh, get a quick you know, dent in the equation. Now, these e small wins are easy, but I really want to take an honest look at how we did over the past couple of years. As you can see, we definitely, it's a dynamic moving target. Your company will have releases to do, and there's a whole bunch of things that is going to come your way. But we went from, if you look at May of 2019 and the last month, May of 2020, we are talking about more than a 25 percentage drop. We are talking about more employees added in the last year, more products being shipped, more releases. So we are talking about probably 30% plus, but I just would go with 25% for the sake of this presentation. All of the actions that I just mentioned now, without much transformation, helped us save a ton of money. So over the year, this could potentially be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And as I mentioned earlier, Without some rock star scrum masters, we had product owners. Some of my counterparts were development leads, and we had a fantastic architect also from internal IT. We would not be able to pull this off. As you can see, you know the testament here. So let's look at our scorecard. Um, all of our in scope migration servers, that is 1300 plus, were migrated in nine months. It was optimized and transformation, we are well on our way. So I'm going to pause here real quick and considering the time we are going to. Um, I'm going to quickly walk you through this slide and pause for questions here. If if you want to take this whole thing that I mentioned and put on plan on a page, I would say pre migration. You have a little bit of homework to do. Choose how much of cloud transformation you want to go through. Do you really want to go an IaaS model or do you really want to go into a PaaS or a SaaS model? Publish the vision and in every section you can see on screen, I have underscored one particular element that stands out to me as a business owner or you know, from a business standpoint. In this particular case, pre-migration, please get buy-in from your app teams. Bake this into your roadmap. There's going to be some disruptions. Define a performance baseline. Most of you probably have performances running. It's going to be very useful once you migrate to the cloud. While you are migrating, start with a small win. Leverage automation as much as you can. And I'm again highlighting an important thing. You will have IT project managers and typically in large corporations, IT will not and does not know what the app teams are doing on a day to day basis. So you will need a single point of contact or a spark. Who is from the business who can work with IT, making sure all your business stakeholders are aligned to this migration. Fine tune executive communication and lock in server baseline. What if you fail? If you fail, make sure you can roll back to your data center VMs. So do not delete them for 15, 30, 60 days. You know, it's up to you. Post migration, we already talked about cost monitoring. Make sure you run your performance test again to make sure there's no performance degradation. Focus on governance, eliminating old infrastructure and thorough testing. I'm not going to talk about transformation now because we have a whole section here just for transformation. Pausing here real quick for a couple of minutes for questions, uh, Michael. OK, let's get a, a couple of questions in here. So in a, in a left and shift, how do you balance cost savings against legacy applications that require 24 seven availability? Good question. So we had 
few VMs because this was our development workload. Few of the VMs, Agile project management tool, the file servers, they all had to run 24 by 7. We created a separate subscription and made sure it has got the best level of DR. You know, the disaster recovery is one element and we purchased reserved instances for it because when I know those VMs are going to run 24 bar 7, 365 days, it was a no brainer to make that investment and get a 30 to 50 percentage cost saving. And um, so that was primarily how we took care of those servers that had to run 24 bar 7. The other servers, as I mentioned earlier, we definitely looked at utility computing model there. OK, we have 12 minutes left. Let's go ahead and push on with the presentation mm -hmm. and then we'll see if we have time at the end for the sure. rest of the questions. I'm, I'm going to blow through this real quick. Um, none of us are probably here new to transformation, so most of us have heard this. What really is transformation? I'm going to just give you one example. Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something really interesting is happening. We are probably in the middle of one of the best eras of digital transformation. Now, as an organization, uh, my employer, Walter Sclover ELM, always would love to be in the bleeding edge of technology. There's uh, uh, dozens of awards that we have won, so there's always a focus on digital transformation. So if you're in an organization like this, digital transformation is probably going to be a simple step. Some of the practical steps, what we want to take, we want to definitely look at governance in a better way. Optimization, we definitely like to use containerization. We are looking at a POC to move to Azure SQL and start using Azure functions. We already have made the move to Azure DevOps, so we are already uh, well on our way to transformation. Many of us have heard of these terms. IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. What does it even mean? The question really you have to answer is, how much do you want to manage and how much do you want a provider to manage? Now, on far left, on-prem, most of it is managed by you when your data center is on-prem. If you are moving to an IaaS model, you manage less. If you move to pass, you really manage lesser and let your provider manage more. If this is too technical for you, how about looking at pass in a different way? Pizza as a service. You want to make pizza at home from the cheese to the dining table. You got to provide everything. What about a take and bake pizza? You manage just a bunch of things, but the pizza dough, the sauce, toppings and cheese is managed by your vendor. Now, what's the most? What do we do if we want a pizza? We always look at pass, right? We just pick up the phone and they deliver the pizza. So this is an analogy or an example I would ask highly recommend for you to think about how much do you want to focus on managing your infrastructure or do you really want to do what you're good at and you want to spend money there? And as you start on a digital transformation journey, you're going to have pushback. So be prepared. Your digital transformation ship is going to move forward only if you destroy this iceberg. You're going to have people who are going to say, oh, we don't need to do it here. That's not how we do here. We've always done it that way. If it ain't broke, why fix it? Um, we tried that. You know, we tried containers two years ago. It didn't work. You know, why do you really want to try it again? Um, that is not going to work here for our product. So please understand that there's a lot of psychology behind the iceberg that you see here. Um, another research survey where they asked the question, hey, which of the following describes your organization's status in regards to a DT effort? Most of the leaders had adoption of AI. Most of the leaders had a, a strategy, a cloud-based infrastructure, and most of the libraries didn't really have a plan. Um, most of you are familiar with this. In the interest of saving time, I'm going to skip through this. This is a modern cloud environment. There's different perceptions about digital transformation, something that it's all about technology. It's not, it's about our culture. If you really want to transform, it depends on the agility and the adaptability of your organization. We are told it's a digital problem, so we need experts to come and fix it. It's not just a digital problem. It's actually about human behavior, not just tech. Some of us have the perception that we can spend our way to leadership. There was a Bain and Company study that actually stated that 
only 8% of the folks are who are leaders and they didn't spend much. Some more perceptions. I need to lift and shift or transform everything at once. Doing everything at once would increase your risk of failure. So take an agile approach. Some of us feel that digital transformation is simple. We have heard it before. Like any successful approach, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. And it will not happen naturally. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of work in the trenches if you really want to actually transform. Now, most of us are familiar if you worked in a corporation with smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, time bound. I'm not going to put you through it again, and you're not going to find this on the web. When I actually looked at how we are transforming, I came up with a smart approach. This is an acronym that it's very simple and non-technical, but you can take it back to your teams. Let's just start on a strategy. That's the yes. Do you have a digital transformation strategy? It could be a one pager. Can you start on that? And the M is why do you want to do it again? Can we have a metrics driven organization where the business outcomes are measurable? Is it to save cost? Is it to be a leader in your market segment? Is it to be more agile and adaptable? Why do you want to do it? Please take an agile approach. If they can build aircrafts using an agile approach, we can definitely transform an organization by making incremental improvements. You don't have to do it all at once. R, reducing technical debt. Most of the leaders who were polled in several research um, studies said one thing, the number one deterrent or the number one impediment for digital transformation in my organization is reducing technical debt. You don't need to go to the cloud to reduce technical debt. My humble request, please don't take all your debt to the cloud. You will have a lot of work to do and it's going to be expensive. What's the technical debt you can reduce now? Are there products that could be refactored now? Can you bake it into 2021 roadmap? Let's reduce technical debt now. That's where digital transformation starts. T is for training. There's a lot of learning that's needed, but you provide the S, M, A, and R. I can guarantee you there'll be individuals in your organization who will raise a hand, join your community of practice, and they will definitely want to learn. I'm going to stop in a minute here, but let me ask you, let me challenge you, what could go wrong even if you try digital transformation? And if it doesn't go well, like George Westerman has said, you will still have a very fast caterpillar. 90% of the CEOs believe that the digital economy will impact the industry, but most people do not have a strategy. So I'm going to stop here and um, ask if there's any questions. Back to Michael. Yes, we have a few more. So what were the things that delayed you during your migration to the cloud the most that were unexpected? Okay, so Number one was we had to get the app teams ready for testing. You know, there would be PTO schedules that we had to work around. Um, when you are migrating one move group, the depart the IT guys have already moved to another move group and the app team because of the release date did not give the feedback on time. So it was a ripple effect. When you are battling one move groups issues, you're unable to go back and check something else. So just making sure that everybody is lined up was one of the challenges for sure. Um, and as I, I think I touched on earlier, some of the interconnected nature. Um, VDI was another problem that we had. Our VDI solution was not mature enough for us to migrate. We didn't think about it earlier, so we had to quickly go back to the whiteboard. So that was another one. Um, I had to get multiple security um, approvals for customer data on the cloud. So another five, maybe 10 more meetings. So these are things that you don't plan. And because our timeline was aggressive, nine months for 1500 servers, all of this, right? It was um, everything made a big difference. Uh, okay, we have, we have time for one last question. Uh, how did multiple scrum teams communicate between each other if some work overlapped? Did you use scrum of scrums or something else? Yeah, we did have scrum of scrums and we had some really good scrum masters who would actually be communicating. Um, one of my goals was not to be the bottleneck. So all of these communications, we would just 
copy the engineering PMO where, where you had actually all of the Scrum Masters. So Scrum Masters had their head on a Super Bowl, and I had actually a rock star Scrum Master who is, uh, her name is Eva. She's actually still helping with the optimization. So I was surprised that, you know, people who are, Scrum Masters are normally very organized and um, they they would love to help. You know, I don't know specifically each team Scrum Master here, but just reach out and um, they'd be, they'd, they are very organized. I think Scrum Master, an average Scrum Master is more organized than me. So, um, you know, that is how we communicated the distribution list and we did have um, morning standups and we definitely had Scrum Scrums. Um, Scrum Scrums was definitely a tool that we used heavily. All good questions. Yeah, that's our, that's our last question. Cool, thank you all so much. I have, um, it has been a privilege uh, to talk to you all and Here's my LinkedIn handle and also my, I mean, my LinkedIn URL and my Twitter handle. Uh, finally, we are making the elephant dance. So if you have questions, just hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I know several of you are here because you are agents of change and agents of transformation. Uh, me being not from the IT department, you know, me being from the business, if we could do it as a team, uh, I think any organization can do it. It is just a matter of uh, making sure you line up the right people, uh, communicate, collaborate, and please invest in your community of practice. Thank you, Devlin, Max, Michael, and team once again, and thank you all for attending. Thank you all for attending today's session, and Matthew, Joshua, thank you for your great and informative presentation. Uh, we value thank continuous you, improvement and your feedback. Uh, please complete a survey for this session by logging into sked.com, locating this session, and then clicking the feedback survey button. Uh, the recording of this session will be available tomorrow. To view the recording, locate the session from your sched.com schedule and click the video stream button. We hope you enjoy the rest of Virtual Agile Shift. Have a good day.